So hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of GCV's The Next Wave webinar series. My name is Fernando Moncada. I'm a senior reporter here at GCV, and today we'll be talking about hospital tech, hospital technology, and what the hospital of the future is going to look like. Um, and, and joining me is a, is a panel of four experts who deal with this stuff day in and day out across three continents, uh, no less. Uh, first, we've got Eric King, Investment Director at Intel Capital, um, who's responsible for Intel Capital's health and life sciences related investments. We've got uh, Tasco here, um, Senior Intellectual Property, Innovation and Commercialization Research Manager at Guys and St. Thomas's NHS Foundation Trust, uh, focusing on, uh, to, to put it in simple terms, um, uh, bringing ideas to fruition and, and implementation. And we've got Dr. Will Caldwell. It, it, I'm always excited when we have an MD on the panel. That's always a good sign. Um, CEO of Sevilla Health, uh, which which develops and provides, um, again, to put it in simple terms, which I'm sure uh, Will will we'll elaborate on, um, provides the data analytics and workflow software for hospitals um, and has received investment from Intel Capital. Um, and lastly, but certainly not least, uh, Gustavo Cavinaghi, uh, head of investments at, at Cortex Ventures, which is a, a Brazilian VC unit uh, investing on behalf of corporates, including uh, diagnostic services providers Fleury and Sabine as well as health insurer, uh, Redesco Saúde. And just to kind of give you guys a, a bit of a, of, of a taster of, 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 you know, preview some of the things that we may touch on on the, on the discussion, uh, you know, we've got the movement of, of traditionally, you know, hospital-based functions uh, to the home setting, you know, the, the differences in how system works, uh, how systems rather work across geographies. Um, and again, I, I think we're quite lucky to have a pretty good geographic spread here on the panel. Um, the ever-present challenge of, of capacity constraints at hospitals and, and how we may go about alleviating them, um, how to actually implement exciting or seemingly effective technologies at scale, uh, you know, what technologies we could expect to make an impact in the coming years, and what investors and startups should know. Um, and I also want to let the audience know that, that there is a Q&A function uh, here on the webinar, uh, so please do send in your questions uh, throughout the session whether to a specific panelist or to the whole panel, and we'll we'll do our best to, to get uh, to them. Um, now, that, that's enough of a preamble from me. I, I'm not the one who, who you all logged in uh, to listen to, so, so let me uh, bring out the panel here. Um, and let, let's maybe start with some, some very brief introductions. I'll, I'll just go around the group, um, and if everyone can, you know, in, in about 30 seconds or so, just kind of say, you know, who they are and, and, and what they do, and, and maybe we can, we can start with you, Tess. Yeah, thank you, Fernando. Thank you. Um, yes, as Fernando mentioned, I am responsible for intellectual property commercialization at Guy's and St. Thomas's. I've, I've been there about three years, and previously, uh, my background is, is in university technology transfer, mostly in the medical field, but I have worked in other, other disciplines too. Oh, perfect. Uh, how about you, Gustavo? Hi, everybody. Uh... So uh, Cortex Ventures is a uh, is a healthcare venture capital firm based in Sao Paulo. We invest globally, but our thesis is focused only in investing in technologies that we can uh, look all around the world and bring into Latin America. So uh, we have a, a team that is looking worldwide and uh, we're trying to figure out what, what, what technologies can we enable to access a huge market such as Brazil, Mexico, Colombia, and help those entrepreneurs to accessing these opportunities in Latin America. Thanks, Gustavo. How, how about you, Eric? Uh, yes, uh, thanks, Fernando. So uh, Eric King with Intel Capital. I'm responsible for our health and life sciences related investments. I'm on the board of about five healthcare companies and uh, board observer on a few others and looking forward to the discussion. Yeah, and I'm Will Caldwell. I'm a physician, uh, head neck surgeon, still practice, still operate, but I'm CEO of Sevilla Health and we really focus on how do you bring process in a scalable way into healthcare and achieve better outcomes through better process. We're based here in, in North America in Salt Lake City. Perfect. Well, with, with that, let, let's just jump right into it then. Um, I, I think one of the more kind of fascinating aspects about this topic and about the topic of hospital tech and 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 what you know the future of a hospital will look like is you know uh, perhaps counterintuitively the, the 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 fact that many of the in hospital functions as we know them today. Uh, may not necessarily be contained within the within the walls of a, of a hospital, you know. In in the future, they're increasingly kind of moved closer to the patient, inside their their kind of very homes, and, and this is really a, a direction of travel that we've been seeing for quite some time now. 
And I, I want to start, if I may, asking asking the investors on the panel, um, Eric and Gustavo, um, both of whom have you know startups in their portfolios that are focused on on this on, on this area. Um, Eric, you know, I Intel, you know, has um, in his portfolio, among other companies, you know, a company like Exo Imaging, which which um, you know, in, in simple terms, you know, and uh, uh, please elaborate on this if, if it's a bit incomplete, but you know, essentially does you know sonographs, you know, wherever you are. Um, and, and Gustavo, you have, you know, companies like, like Isolabs, for example, which among other things does, you know, at home vaccinations and the like, um, you know, it, it, you know, talk, talk about, you know, how you see this flow of, of, of hospital functionality moving towards the home, you know, what's it been looking like over the past few years and, and where are we expecting it to go? Well, I can I can jump in. Well, one of the things that um, I, I should highlight is that we have an investment thesis on what we call distributed care, and it's really about enabling care outside the traditional walls of the provider. And as part of that, you know, there's a there's a number of elements and investments that we've made in that space. You, you referred to one of the investments we've done in medical imaging to make medical imaging easier to use, more portable, and in doing that by using um, advanced computation and analytics, right, to make things just simpler. You know, just put, you know, I think one of our objectives is to make the technologies invisible as as possible and just make the, the experience easier and thereby enabling um, people with less training to be able to do very important things like in medical imaging in particular. But the other investment that's kind of a cornerstone of our investment in, we'll call it the hospital home or distributed care area is Bioformis. And it's basically a platform that enables providers, you know, large hospitals, or I guess all size hospitals, to be able to care for their um, patients in their homes, right? So there's a lot of technology that's required as well as logistics to be able to take responsibility for people that aren't, you know, just down down the, you know, the aisle from you. Um, and that, that's something that they enable. And we see that as a key part of um, the future of, of healthcare. Uh, because we see that it can, it has the ability to not only reduce cost, but also to improve outcomes. And uh, that's at the cornerstone of our investment thesis in distributed care. Gustavo, I'll pass it to you. Yeah, perfect. So uh, I'll try to, to bring a, a, an overview on, on Latin America that is, uh, we, we share the same kind of problems, but, but we do have some, some, uh, some issues that are particularly different into the, into countries such as Brazil. But I think the main issue might be the same because, you know, not, not only the real estate, but everything that surrounds a hospital is expensive. Labor is expensive. The assets are expensive. Uh, the time of everybody is very expensive. So when we look into a thesis that, uh, that is trying to bring dehospitalization and bringing care to the, to the home of the patients, it seems to, to take a burden off the, off the entire healthcare system. And that's what we did with the with Disa Labs, one of our portfolio companies. It started as a at home testing company. They uh, they were trying to bring patients out of the hospitals and and bringing lab tests to the home, and they evolved to a at home care company. So now they are doing uh, medications. They are doing uh, everything that you can take out of emergency rooms or uh, that you that you can treat the patient inside their house. They are trying to uh, to provide to uh, to a large uh, amount of patients, uh, and what we're seeing here is that our our major clients are healthcare uh, insurers, and the reason why they're paying them is because it's a lot cheaper to treat that patient at home, or to bring care to the home, to the house of the patient than to do that inside a hospital. They want they want to use the hospital for the complexity complex stuff, and for things that they really need to be at the hospital. And Will here can, can, can jump in if, if, he, uh, if he wishes because he's an MD, I'm an engineer. But uh, as we are seeing this, this model evolves, it makes a lot of sense. Throughout history, we use it to have the, the, the MD visiting patients and that they were delivering care at home. And then with the, with the, with the hospitals chains and, and all the value chain uh, kind of became hospital centric and not more patient centric. And we're seeing with digital products, with uh, data integration, and uh, with all the assets that we're developing and, and fast throughout healthcare, that we're kind of going towards being patient-centric again and, uh, and going more towards uh, value-based healthcare, which is something that we, that we believe is going to be very big, not in the short term, but maybe in the long term. Uh, and that's, uh, that's something that, that, that's pretty big for us here. 
Wait, Will, did you did you want to ju jump in there with something? As <laughs> I, I think, Will, this is the days when he could go uh, to people's homes and take care of them. <laughs> you know, I just I just went to someone's home. I was uh, actually on call over the weekend. Uh, I do facial trauma, and I actually just went to a home visit. And and this is an aside, but um, you think it's good for patients and good for the system. It's really good for providers. And mm. I'll tell you why. You know, we're we're in a stage where we're all burning out. You, you hear about this all the time. And we get bitter, we get cynical, right? At three in the morning, you're in the ER taking care of a patient that's intoxicated or whatnot, and they're not very nice to you. And, you know, there are all sorts of, of, of thoughts that kind of go through your head and, and none of us want to function in, in that sort of mindset. And when you go to someone's home, all of a sudden that person that you typically would see in the ER at two in the morning, you're seeing them in their own environment at home. This hot place I went in, there were holes in the floor. This is in North Carolina holes in the floor. They had uh, plastic bags taped around the windows. Uh, they had a space heater keeping them warm. They had a, a, a cooler for their refrigerator with an ice with ice in it because the refrigerator was broken. And I guess my point is you begin to make it personal when you go do a home visit and you remember, you think, oh my God, these people have incredible challenges. If they can get to the ER at two in the morning, you know, they're coming in Here's this guy that doesn't look anything like him sometimes. Um, he's in this white coat. He's maybe ha not that happy to be there at two in the morning. And, you know, they're scared. They don't know what to expect. And so I, I guess there are a lot of benefits to getting things out of the hospital, not just technology and home nursing and home care, but physicians to get back to the home. It, it helps me, you know, after that experience, what I realized is it helped me be less cynical about when I do go in at two or three in the morning, because it's now much more personal, much more personal. So that would be a comment. I think the, the last comment I'll make, you know, we've been saying, somebody said, what's the future of healthcare a decade ago? I think I was talking to Bill Frist from HCA, which is interesting because it's a hospital company, right? <laughs> and we said, all things outpatient, everything's moving out of the hospital. And while I think the, there's a lot to be said for that, hospital capacities are the highest they've ever been. Um, acuity of care in an aging population is as high as it's ever been. And so when you're, when you're operating in a hospital like I was this weekend, where you're at 97, 98% capacity and people are really sick, I think we're, we're always going to have hospitals, right? We're always going to need them. And the notion that everything can move out of the hospital, uh, I'm not quite as dogmatic about that anymore. Um, I think it's true, but I also think hospitals are, are gonna continue to be important. So I think about rather than the future hospital, it's what's the new ecosystem of healthcare look like and who are the new players? And how do you, how do you then connect those different players, um, both in terms of data flow and, and process, which is a big problem in healthcare. We don't have good process sometimes. So those would be my initial thoughts. Yeah, just one thing I'll just add on top of what Will said is like, you know, you talked about the personal. And so as a, an investor in a technology company, one of the things that we like to do is look for ways to scale uh, that personal. Right. And so this this whole uh, concept of distributed care and um, hospital at home and things of this nature is really trying to make that personal touch in people's homes scalable. And obviously it doesn't work for every situation. It's There's no intent to get you know, I've, I've seen estimates of like maybe 10 to 20 percent of the hospital patient beds at, you know, some future date could get could, could be in their homes. So it doesn't get to 100 percent, but it's a capability that really enables quality care at scale. Yeah, absolutely. And and I want to come back to the topic of scalability as well as as, as capacity. Um, but but first, I, I want to bring you in here, uh, Tass, to kind of ask, how is this kind of move towards the home manifesting itself within the NHS structure, right? Are, 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 are we seeing kind of trials going on for different at-home services? What, what are people finding? Yeah, the, 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 it is moving in that direction and that, that's certainly what I, uh, I'm seeing. I, I very much see it as a, as a uh, distributed healthcare, yes, you know, a uh, hub and spoke model type, type that you'll operate. And I agree that the, the central hospital will be probably there in the future to deal with the serious cases, much more serious cases where people do need to need to come in. 
and a lot of healthcare will happen in the community and in the home. Now, of course, that's already happening, but I think it will be accelerated. And it'll be accelerated by greater use of technology to be able to do that, that, that we now have, um, you know, including all the IT systems and the wearables, et cetera, that, that patients can now wear. Um, now, I, I appreciate that, um, that that will take the burden off clinicians centrally in the hospital and more, more, more home visits. But because a lot of that will be tech-based, um, for the more less sort of chronic diseases, which are less serious, I think there's likely to be less face-to-face -face contact between a patient and a clinician uh, because they will be monitored at a distance, um, monitored, there may be video calls, but face-to-face -face interactions are, are likely to decrease, decrease in my view. And therefore, I think we need to, to think about how that patient-clinician relationship is managed. So I think it's slightly more complex in, in, in this sense. Yes, it is more convenient for the patient. It is more convenient for clinicians. But that relationship, which is core, that relationship of trust between the patient and the clinician, we must make sure that's maintained. Because particularly, particularly when, um, if there is that trust, then patients are more compliant, what they have to do in terms of medications and follow-up appointments, and the outcomes are better. So that would be my sort of first thought. But I, I think it's a great model in terms of distributed model, um, as, lo as long as some of those issues are, are managed. And it will make healthcare more equal, so greater access in that sense uh, when, when patients are monitored at home and it is more distributed, accessibility of healthcare will be greater. So I think that is the way it's going, yes. And what, what exactly, what's the kind of nature of, of the line that needs to be walked there? Um, mm -hmm. Between, you know, we, we have these monitoring systems, you know, wearables, whatnot, but, but you know, perhaps they have, you know, some blind spots right now that, you know, maybe a clinician in person might be able to, I don't know, diagnose something, I'm, I'm, you know, kind of spitballing here, but, but you know, maybe, you know, Will, as, as, as the doctor on the panel, do, do you see kind of potential downsides there apart from, you know, maybe kind of the, not erosion of, 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 of the trust that you spoke of their task, but are, are, are we missing something from that kind of remote uh, healthcare? Well, a couple of comments. I mean, uh, just a logistical challenge. Um, if, if I start a patient on uh, a blood pressure monitor at home, um, first of all, how do I do that? Because we're so EMR centric, right? We're so focused on, um, the more traditional healthcare ecosystem. And frankly, a lot of the companies that do that type of work are outside of that traditional healthcare ecosystem. And so I've got to go to a website somewhere or somebody in my office to sign them up for home patient monitoring. The other thing is, even if they do it, they come back to see me in six weeks. You want to see a, you want to see a ticked off patient, have them walk in after they've worn something for six weeks and you don't have the results. And they say, how did I do? And you're like, oh, you know, and then you got to go find the results. So I think we've got a lot of work to do to connect the traditional healthcare base, right, to this to these sort of outpatient offerings. I think um, you know that's pretty darn critical. The second thing, and this is a bit um, uh, provocative, perhaps, but I do think the doctor-patient relationship is important. Uh, when I take care of somebody as an inpatient, their compliance against what I recommend is about 100%. If I order a CT scan, they're going to get the CT scan. They're an inpatient. If I order a medication, they're probably going to take it. They might ask a question. That's not true in the ambulatory or outpatient world. So compliance against best practice-driven pathways, use that term, right? We know how to take care of patients that have hypertension, but compliance is not just around the physician doing the right thing. It's now we've got to figure out a way to, as you talked about, as maintaining a relationship is important to try and so the, so the clinician not only makes the right decision, but the patient actually is compliant with that. So if I order a CT in the outpatient setting and the patient doesn't go get it, well, that pathway is broken down, right? That best practice driven pathway. So I think those are, those are challenges. And I think it is important to maintain that doctor patient relationship. But, you know, Fernando, I think we're going to talk a little bit about AI and the role of AI in all of this. The reality is AI can do, in best practice-driven, AI-driven best practices, pathways, 
can do a lot of what a physician does. Really can't, especially, you know, lower acuity problems, outpatient problems. Um, and so what's the difference between a face-to-face -face visit with me as a physician? Well, I guess I can do a physical exam, right, that you can't do remotely or you can't do through an AI tool. But if you talk to most physicians, and there may be some on the call that will throw eggs at me for saying this, we don't use the physical exam like they did 20 years ago, right? We rely on a lot of a lot of other stuff in making diagnoses. And so the physical exam, fortunately or unfortunately, has is, is become less and less important, which, again, allows you to do more things in the outpatient setting where you don't have that face-to-face -face presence. Interesting. And, and, you know, certainly one of the, the uh, upsides of this kind of outpatient care um, is that it helps alleviate one of the bigger problems that hospitals anywhere face, really, and, and that is that of, of, of capacity constraints, right? And, and some of that is, is, you know, completely out of, a, out of you know, a, any individual kind of hospital's control, right? Maybe you're the only hospital in like a 20 mile radius or something, and, and, you know, there's only so much you can do. But, you know, a lot of the time, it really is just, you know, not having enough beds to go around, you know, having, you know, a shortage of staff or, or, or you know, long waiting times for appointments or, or, or diagnostics within a hospital. Um, and, and that kind of goes to, to an even larger point about the efficiency of, of workflows and, and, and processes, like you mentioned earlier, Will. Um, and, and that's kind of, you know, exactly your, 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 your wheelhouse, right? And that's, that kind of speaks to the work that you guys are doing at Sevilla Health. Um, which which you founded in 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 you know 2022 I believe and and same year that you know Eric you know you, you guys at Intel you guys led the uh, eight and a half million dollar uh, seed round, um, so yeah it, it, tell tell us about the the you know the 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 kind of problems that you're trying to solve at, at, at Sevilla. Yeah, so let me back away from Sevilla specifically and talk about healthcare in terms of process because I think that's what a lot of the the audience would be super interested in, and I'm happy to answer questions. But, you know, in, in healthcare, if you talk about healthcare innovation, particularly around technology, a lot of the focus has been on, on technology around documentation, okay, billing, um, order entry, those sorts of things. What do those three things have in common in healthcare? They're all EMR, electronic medical record system centric, right? That's what an EMR does really well, billing, documentation, and coding, right, um, and orders. Um, then you've started to see companies come in and do data analytics, data management. Um, you've started to see care model transformation, right, to some degree. Um, what you haven't seen in healthcare that you've seen in car industry and, you know, Toyota and Ed Deming, um, You've seen in uh, all sorts of, of manufacturing all around the world is this process, I say a process revolution. So in healthcare, we know exactly, in most cases, we know the best practice, the next step of the things that need to be done to take care of a patient when we see them. The problem is the variation in the care that's being provided at similar hospitals in similar regions is all over the place. So could there be two right or two two best ways of taking care of a patient with sepsis? Well, maybe, but, but probably in, a, in today's day and age, it's more around, uh, it, it's, it's more that there's one best way to do it in a given setting. And the question is, how do we create a process or a tool that gives me the physician something that helps me adhere to those steps, right? So if, if patient comes in with sepsis, here are the 14 things that need to happen. Here are the people that need to do them and the order it needs to happen. How do you how do you use technology to digitize that and push that into the workflow? We've done that in every other industry, every industry, but we haven't done it in healthcare. And so when we talk about AI and we talk about it's really cool stuff, but that's just more technology that, in my opinion, doesn't address the real challenge in healthcare, which is how do you digitize and standardize process? How do you help me as a doc do the right thing for the patient, which is what I want to do anyway? How do you use technology to do that in a scalable way? That's what we do at Sevilla. That's, that's, that's the core of what we do. And I think it's the core of how we're going to improve healthcare. And why is it not happening? Well, I started with the EMRs. EMRs are great at doing what they do. But there's a huge disconnect between health system IT departments and health system last mile providers. 
And I've been in boardrooms. I was in one last week where I had IT folks um, who were very EMR centric. Not all of them, but, but many. And we had clinicians. And these were service line leaders, not C-suite clinicians. These are service line leaders who are taking care of patients. And I'm doing a presentation on Sevilla and the IT folks inevitably say, well, we're already doing that. We do that in Epic or we do that in Cerner. We do that, at, you know, and you, gosh, I wish you guys could see the faces of the clinicians when those statements are made. There's a huge disconnect right now between what the IT functions in hospital think they're doing to help clinicians with process and what's actually happening. Huge disconnect. And we got to figure out how to, how to, how to break that down. Well, maybe I can share an experience that I had um, talking to um, a CXO of a large provider, um, and he was actually talking about their objectives of their hospital of the, of the future in terms like process control and other, I'll call it like manufacturing-like terms. And at first, um, it took me off, you know, a little bit off guard. I was, you know, even though, you know, Intel, you know, we, we love factories and all that sort of stuff, but I was still a little bit surprised that there was, it didn't have this like human touch kind of concept or feel to his his comments. Um, but when you double click on it, basically what he was trying to do is to implement quality care across all the organization, across multiple states, multiple hospitals, and a lot of different people, right? So how do you improve process? How do you improve quality if you don't digitize the workflow or you know, do the things that like uh, Will is talking about to really have process control, to deliver quality care over and over and over again, and not have the variability of outcomes and uh, and care that we see today. Um, and, and what's the and what's the fabric? What's the data fabric, right? That connects the what we're talking about is things the the new system ecosystem outside of the hospital. And and Eric Gustavo, you guys are and Taj, you're probably investing in a lot of companies that are doing that, right? And so it's not hospital systems that are investing in this. It's private equity, it's venture funds, it's, it's, it's people outside of the hospital centric world. And, you know, you're creating data. How do you, how do you, if a patient starts a pathway in the hospital and then moves to home care, hospital at home, mm -hmm. well, if, if the process is focused on the EMR in the hospital, well, you don't have the EMR at home. And you certainly, in many cases, you don't even have the EMR in the home health folks. You don't have the EMR in the, in the wearables providers. So all of the data that's that's happening and things that are happening with that process that are good for patients, good for the system, none of that data is connected back to the to the hospital centric EMR. And so we've got to figure out that data fabric layer, and that's part of that's part of what we're working on. Yeah, I don't know about uh, Eric's experience, but uh, we're we're exactly investing in this kind of in this kind of companies. But the the difficult to implement the solutions into the healthcare uh, clients, it's it's extreme. It's very hard to convince them. The, the sales cycles are, are incredibly long. We're talking about one year to, to put a company to sell to a, to a hospital, to a provider, or even to an insurer. And I remember a, a, a specific case. It, it was, I think, two years ago, maybe a little bit more. That was shocking to me. I was, uh, we were uh, looking into that company. They were a, a heart diagnostics company. They, they did a, Graphic diagnostics. I don't know if that's the right way to say it. You know, uh, uh, EKG, uh, Holter, and, and stuff like that. Yeah. And I went to one one of our LPs, the, the biggest diagnostics company in the country, to understand how do you guys do it? What's the process? Uh, what is in paper? What is digitized? So uh, I was I spent an entire afternoon learning from the from the doctors from everything how they did that, and they literally did on paper. So the patient went in, took the took the holder off, and then they printed the exam into a sheet of paper. And then the, the doctor with a ruler was looking into the, the numbers and with a pen marking up. I said, I, I don't believe that. This is the biggest diagnostic company in the country. And they are doing that by hand with a piece of paper. And the company that we were looking at was digitizing everything. And in my mind, it was, okay, we got, we got a deal. I'm going to invest in that company. It took them one year to do a proof of concept, to prove that their, their technology was worth it. That So it, it's very, very hard to get into the big clients. Not, not only in the big clients, but doing business in healthcare, it's, uh, it's slow. 
uh, not only because the, the the corporations are big, but also because they're you're, you're dealing with patients, you're dealing with lives. So everybody is, is all trying to to cover all the corners yeah, uh, be before very... implementing anything. So we, we're we're kind of changing our mindset here into doing venture capital in healthcare. It's very different than doing venture capital in any other vertical because we don't see exponential growth such as you've seen in fintech, for example, such as you've seen consumer goods. It's a different business. It's, it's, it's a whole different animal. So we have to figure out even from valuation, from uh, uh, all the expectations that you have in a company, even a digital one has to be set to that specific environment. I, I do believe that that a lot of change is going to is going to happen into the healthcare system. A lot of that from digital companies, but it's a it's a whole different game, and and we're having some different experiences here. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right, Gustavo. I think there's a lot of really what I'll call sad stories about you think that everything is so sophisticated and there's so much, um, you know, I guess silos of sophistication, but the things that net things together, you know, where people are actually still using manual processes to do things is like, from my perspective, like ridiculous, but you're absolutely right. The healthcare industry is, is slow to adopt technology. They're being very careful you know, you don't get sued for the process that you have. So you want to make changes very carefully and things of this nature. But when we get things like that accomplished, the amount of good and efficiency that you can drive into an organization is really compelling, right? So we, we can't give up. Yeah. Fernando, if I, if I could add to those comments, I, I totally course, agree. Yeah, that, yeah I, I totally agree. I mean, I'm, I'm talking from a hospital perspective. It, 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 I totally agree with the comments that it is difficult for, techno for technologies to be adopted within within hospitals, there is a certain level of resistance over the years, and, and there's good reason for that. From from certainly from a clinical point of view, that it is all about patient safety comes first. Um, but I also think that um, hospitals need to adopt technologies much more quickly, and I certainly think that's the case uh, in the UK within the, with the NHS, which is which is known to be. Uh, slow in adopting new technologies, but I think it's really critical for its longer term development that he adopts technologies m much quicker and is more, more proactive in doing so. So, and, and you know, and, and I try and commercialize IP from within the hospital and I can, within a hospital environment, and, um, you know, I can see the frustrations when, when companies are coming to approaching us with new technologies um, that I, you know, I, would like to see more technologies taken up for patient benefit, et cetera. But there is a reluctance in that, and that does need to be tackled. I mean, that's, so I, I wanted to agree with the other panelists that it's something about the culture needs to change within within a, a medical environment, yeah. Yeah, and, and fo following from that, you, you guys mentioned, you know, it's difficult to implement, um, you know, new technology in the healthcare in in industry, but I think, you know, a more precise way to put it would be healthcare industries, uh, plural, right? Because it's different yeah. depending on where you are, and and you know, I, I'm curious um, to hear from from you know our, our, our various kind of you know geographical representations here, where where the kind of respective choke points are in the respective system. So so may, maybe you know in the NHS, um, where, where do those tend to be? I don't think there's any one particular place. I think the the issue of patient safety always comes first. And therefore, there's a reluctance to take on new technologies. And I think sometimes it may be at the clinic clinician level because there is, you know, decision making. There are certain set pathways, patient care pathways, and to deviate from those pathways is a risk. Yeah. Uh, and so it, it'll be clinical points. There'll be IT people. Yes. I mean, IT departments within hospitals have their own way of doing things. There's a certain culture. And even IT departments need to communicate better with the clinical, you know, the clinical community within the hospital. So I think there's various points at which there's a, a lack of adoption, and and certainly one of and guys and Sir Thomas, you certainly recognise that, and we are taking steps proactively to try and facilitate uptake and be a, a sort of model for other NHS trusts within uh, within the UK to be able to take up faster. So we are taking steps. Um, the other thing is one, there's not one, one point, there could be any number of points to, to address.
Yeah. yeah, Fernando, maybe one one thing I would add to that, too, because I definitely think there's a clinical sell, right? You have to be able to show that you're going to improve outcomes and that this is like a, a better solution than what you have. You have bandwidth issues in IT that that's mentioned as well. You know, they've got, you know, there's so much financial pressure in these uh, provider organizations that these IT organizations have shrunk over the last few years. And, and so you have to be a really high priority to be able to even get implemented, even if they clinically want you. And then the, the one that I do want to add is that financial hurdle. So again, the, these providers are under um, financial constraints. And so you have to be able to show that you're going to deliver near-term um, ROI, you know, return on investment, that you're going to drive near-term efficiencies, where you're going to get the clinical done, you're going to get the IT support, and you're going to get killed in the CFO's office. Yeah. And so, um, so I think really being able to demonstrate that your solution rings all these bells, right? We'll call these the big three for, for now to, to go through the sales process. Um, yeah. You're going to have problems. But if you can do all three and demonstrate all three, the um, we'll call it the retention value and the expansion value within these provider organizations is very compelling. And yeah. uh, and so I still think the opportunity is very exciting there. Yeah, Eric, if I could also add, actually, what I, when, when I'm approached by companies who want to... Uh, to deliver tech into the, into the hospital. One of the things I always say to them, think critically about what keeps senior hospital managers awake at night. And are you, and are you addressing those problems? You know, right. you know in, currently in the UK, it's long waiting lists, financial constraints. And whatever product you're selling into the NHS, are you thinking critically about solving those problems and not just adding another layer of cost? Because yeah. it is difficult for a, NHS organization, any hospital organization to take on new tech, it has to be replacing something else, not just adding to what we already have. Otherwise, you're adding layers of costs. So as long as you critically think about, you know, are you really addressing a need of the hospital and something that keeps those managers awake at night, really, then you then you might be able to present your, your, your sort of offering better. Now that's you know one of one of my thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah I, I couldn't agree more with with you guys. And I, I I have seen problems in hospitals in the U.S. and problems in the hospital in Brazil and problems in hospitals in Mexico. They are in essence all the same. It's all about ROI. They are always they are all struggling, and they're and every single one of them told me, Gustavo, if you have a solution that is improving quality or it's nice. But what, what can you bring me that's going to reduce costs or that's going to bring more patients in? What what can you what can you bring me that is, has a that you can prove me that in the short term or near term you're gonna bring me uh, ROI? And in the US, for example, you have a, a the shortage of nurses. That's a huge issue. We don't have that in Brazil, but we have a uh, huge lines into the Brazilian version of, of the NHS, which is SUS, it's our version of the universal healthcare. So I have a huge problem with access. They are all struggling. With, uh, with ways to make the system more efficient and they don't have a lot of money to spend. They have to be very surgical on that. And I also couldn't agree more with Will in terms of processes and, and systems. I mean, I, I, I get the AI is changing everything, but healthcare, at least in my point of view, might be a step behind. We need to, we need to build processes. We need to digitize these processes. We, we, we haven't got there yet. We're not there yet. Where it's nice to implement AI. There's a lot of great solutions there, but we need to we need to to make these factories uh, operationals before before we do that. And, and I love that, Eric. I love the buckets you the three buckets Eric that you just outlined with with clinicians, IT, and financial. You know, comment I would make if if um, there's been a huge sea change among clinicians. When I first started, I've, I've been in practice 23 years. When I first started. Clinicians were cantankerous sometimes, hard to believe. We thought we were, you know, whatever. We didn't want to change. We liked the way we did it. You know, the notion that somebody would tell me, here's the process in taking care of a patient with problem A was somewhat um, distasteful. We've seen that completely go away in healthcare. Clinicians today are hungry for standardization process, hungry, receptive. And so when I go in and I try to sell a Sevilla tool, a platform, you know, the clinicians are easy. The clinicians say, oh my gosh, we've been waiting on this, all of them. We then said, well, we're running into your CFO. So we said, well, 
let's let's take a look at ROI. And you're exactly right, Gustavo. ROI matters. And so we we created tools that you know you could achieve a six to ten x ROI in year one. Fully baked ROI. That's not just my cost, the cost for my tool, but the internal cost. Okay, so we check that box. And yet we're still taking a year, year and a half to, to sell into healthcare systems. So the the stop, Fernando, you said where is the roadblock right now? It's in the IT department and specifically the EMR world. And everybody's saying we can do this, we can do this. Well, I'll tell a story. You know, I was in we had spring break recently, and I took my daughters over to Copenhagen, Denmark. And if you've never been, it's a wonderful place. And there's a great modern art museum called the Louisiana right outside of um, Copenhagen. And um, we took the train out and it's beautiful. You got to go. And a lot of the art I liked, I, I appreciated it. I got it. Some of it I looked at and I was looking at my 16 year old, one of my daughters. I said, you know, I think I could do that. And she turned and looked at me and she said, yeah, but dad, you didn't. And she walked off to the next piece. So I say that, I think that all the time I hear, well, we could do that. We could do this or we could do this, but we've had, you know, decades of, of EMR implementation. And yet we still hear clinicians say, we don't have the process tools that we need, the clinical decision support tools. You're not getting it done. And so I can't, well, it's very difficult to overcome that, that IT CIO sent you know, EMR centric hurdle. And I understand these are big investments by systems, but we've got to start having some brave clinicians. And and there are some that stand up and say, no, we're going to do this because this is, this makes sense. Um, really hard though, really hard. And uh, if I'm investing in healthcare right now or in any company, tech company where a hospital system is your buyer, Gustavo, you're right. You've got to factor that into your revenue projections. Eric, you understand that, I'm sure. And, you know, as CEO of a tech company, I have an acute understanding of that. So um, financial, yes. Checkbox, clinical, absolutely. IT, that's, at least in the United States, that's where we're running into a buzzsaw. And, and to that point, um, actually, no, first of all, I want to mention, uh, you know, I, I used to live in Copenhagen, um almost 10 years ago now. Wow, I, I feel old. Um, but no, I've been to that museum, Will, and there was a Yoko Ono exhibition. And I have to say some of those I think I could have done. But that, anyway, that, that's a separate topic. Um, I, yeah, so so you you, you were mentioning that the, the choke point tends to be in the IT department and clinicians tend to get it, you said, that, but others don't. So w w when you guys were fundraising, did you have to do much by way of convincing or, or did most people you know in the in the rooms you walked into kind of understand that this is a this is a big issue that needs a solution so i gotta tell you it was really really interesting incredibly smart people in the financial world right um even those that are healthcare investors you would go sit down and you would show them what we do in terms of digitizing process and creating pathways where you're giving real-time advice to clinicians in a stepwise fashion in a very non-intrusive way, but within their workflow, we would show them this. And 90% of the time, if not more, they would say, wait a second, this isn't already being done? Well, wait a second, what is the, I thought the EMRs did this. I heard that so much. I don't think I heard that from Eric, but I heard that from a lot of investors. Well, it's and all so over the place. A, it's not only in workflows. I bump into it all the time where people think like this, like analytics are actually tracking me to make sure that I'm being okay. And yeah. there's just so much that people assume is actually happening that is really not happening. So that was that was kind of what I ran into when we were raising money was people thought this is a great idea, but this is already being done, right? I'm like, no, because we've not had a process revolution in healthcare. We've not. We've not had a process revolution in healthcare. We've had... Uh, you know, uh, lots of revolutions. Uh, pay, we've had, well, I won't go through them all, but um, we had an industrial revolution and built a bunch of hospitals. We had a quality revolution with the Flexner Report and iterating on quality in the 20s and 30s and 40s. Then we had a hygiene revolution, if you want to call it, with public, uh, you know, uh, uh, pasteurization of milk products and uh, uh, sanitary sewers in cities and uh, vaccinations. And we've had all that. And now we have a tech revolution which has been 
broad in its in its focus with one exception process oh it drives me crazy so we we got to figure that out we got to figure that out because it's the process that we're missing and and you know i've alluded to some of the reasons i think that's the case so well, like you said it's something that seems obvious but you know someone has to actually do it right um and I, I, so expanding from that, you know, I, I want to talk about technology itself a, a bit. And, you know, perhaps, you know, maybe some of the technology that might be a bit, you know, further out. Um, so so I think, Will, earlier you mentioned AI and, and, and how that can be implemented. Um, and, you know, so to, to, to that point, how how is it kind of being implemented? You know, not just AI, but let's start with AI, because, you know, that's been the kind of subject of the past year and perhaps the lowest hanging fruit. Um, but uh, how, how are you guys seeing artificial intelligence and particularly Gen AI kind of coming online? Are, are people taking it seriously yet in the ways that it's being applied? Gustavo, you want to go first? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, 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 from my perspective, people are taking that seriously. And uh, we, we do have a, we don't have a lot of invested companies doing that, but we sure have a few and and they are they are making some some very interesting things and i do believe that that can change a lot of a lot of things in healthcare but as i mentioned before i think there's there are important steps to take before we, we, we implement that so there are specific solutions that we can see a lot of uh gen ai being applied for such as we have a company for example that is doing uh, early cancer triage by uh, blood sampling so they're doing complete blood counts they're taking the, all, all the variables from that. They are applying their algorithms, and they're building a uh, they're building a, a tool to I, will, I won't say diagnost diagnostics, but they're doing a tool to triage, uh, starting with breast cancer, and they're evolving to 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 other ones. So that that's something that's big. That that's huge. They were actually here in, in the U.S. Uh, at, at Google show, showing their their solution. So this is this is this is one thing. Then we're looking at the clinical side of it. But when you look into process, I think if you if you have a the, the first layer, as we will mentioned a lot here, if you have a process, if you digitize that process, then you're able to apply uh, AI or Gen AI or, or anything else. But you have to have the first layer. And what we are seeing, at least in in uh, in, in Brazil specifically, and even in Mexico, we do have another company there. We lack a lot of infrastructure. We lack, we lack a lot of uh, uh, proper IT before you, you do that. I think it will happen, and it's it's already happening. But 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 you have to have the right infrastructure prior to do that. That's for sure. I, I'll bring up a couple of um, AI based um, use cases and stuff like that. So one um, that it comes to mind is like there's computer vision based use cases that are happening uh, throughout the hospitals now and in um, in healthcare and and in life sciences that are pretty interesting. There's um, things around data analytics, not only for driving efficiency within organizations, looking for weaknesses within uh, the performance of your organization, but at, just right down to the care of individuals in acute settings where you're being able to take data from multiple devices that are um, have different data formats. Some of the stuff that Gustavo was talking about is you got to have the, you know, like we'll call it the data in a, in a usable format, you know, that are normalized data, time synchronized. And then advanced analytics can, can track patients, you know, for a number of things. And this is in that category of things that people think are already happening, but by and large is not happening and is, is kind of that next wave of the hospital of the future. And by doing that and getting that infrastructure down correctly and having these, um, you know, algorithms developed to be able to track, you know, patient progress or in more, maybe more importantly, deterioration, you have the ability to create virtual ICUs. And so hospitals are coming up with staffing models to deal with in the U.S. the nursing staffing shortage where you can have virtual um, ICUs. And I sometimes just call it overwatch, right, where you have shortage of, of staffing. You can put very capable people using advanced analytics and great um, data platforms to be able to watch critical, um, critically ill patients across the network, multiple states, you know, things of this nature, and really be able to just say, um, pick up the phone call and call a nurse right in that area and say, hey, look, you need to step in on, on this patient. Uh, we're seeing some deterioration and things of this nature and solve some of those, um, we'll call it um, care models. And then maybe one of the last things I'll bring up is generative AI. Um, I, I, 
talk a lot to our, our sales teams within Intel who uh, work to be the trusted technology advisor within uh, providers, payers, and, and, um, and others in the health and life sciences area. And as they meet with them, there's more and more conversations about, you know, use cases for, for generative AI um, solutions. And um, I'll just mention two that have been kind of interesting that I've seen. One is very simple, is um, at, at every shift change, you know, as nurses and doctors are, are, are trying to put the documentation together um, to go from, you know, shift to shift, you know, handing off from um, Dr. Caldwell to someone else, you know, that document, documentation is a pain in the behind for, for a lot of these um, nurses and physicians. And um, they found ways to be able to, to really automate that where you can kind of read through it, and maybe edit if you need to, but it learns and it becomes more and more like the way that you would normally um, do your notes. Uh, another example is, um, you know, potentially selecting people for um, clinical trials and, um, and, you know, you can do a lot of analytics to select people like, you know, who has this type of cancer. But at the end of the day, um, you have to do chart reviews and you're paying people, I don't know, $100 an hour to review just hundreds and thousands of, of charts to be able to find people that you can put into clinical tri trials. And now using generative AI um, and you're adding some, you know, kind of language understanding to the process, you can do these chart reviews in an automated and more efficient process. But there's there's a lot of use cases for generative AI. Um, but you know it'll get implemented very slowly. It'll be reviewed. It'll be it'll be careful. But um, again, another opportunity for advancement within you know that we'll call it the hospital of the future. I see AI. You know what is it really being used for in healthcare? You know I think clinical trials certainly is a good example. But I think in terms of the provision of healthcare that I that I'm involved in that I do, it's more around um, it's an analytics tool used to provide insights or raise awareness or create a flag. So this patient likely has sepsis. Okay, this patient likely you know has cancer. Whatever the case may be, this patient would likely benefit from X. The the problem is it's an analytics tool, and so. The real challenge, and once again, I'm back to, you know, we have lots of analytics and data management tools, and AI is a great one, and it's going to be a wonderful tool. The real challenge, though, that we still haven't addressed is how do you take the insights that AI can generate, and how do you get those insights in real time to the last interface where all the work happens, frankly, which is between mm -hmm. the provider and the patient, whatever that looks like. Maybe that provider is, you know, remote. It doesn't matter. But if you can't take the insights that are generated with AI, an analytics tool, a data management tool, a, a very good one, and actually translate it into usable information at the at the last interface, the last mile, right? We I work at partners in uh, uh, partners in health and places like Haiti, and, and we talk about the last mile of healthcare. Well, we have the same problem here, and so until we can take those insights, embed them into a workflow, and provide advice to the very last step. Um, AI is great, but it's gonna be limited in my opinion. And do, do, you, do you see that kind of shift happening at any point will be you know, like the, the kind of bridging between the kind of analytics tool that you mentioned to a more prescriptive one, where it kind of tells you what the treatment sh should be, or are we are we far from that? So. Well, the, the question is, it's not a, it's not black and white, it's not like, you take a bunch of data and you say, do A, okay? You're taking a bunch of data and it's informing step A, step B, step C, step D, step E. These are all different steps along a pathway from right. where you are today to where you wanna be in terms of your health, right? There are a bunch of steps. And, and so in order to do that, and I think Gustavo touched on this earlier, you've got to embed AI functions within something that helps create that that map, that pathway from where you are today to where you want to be. So sickness to health, right? Or whatever the case may be. And so I, I guess my response is it's not just a, it's not binary. It's not here, AI says, here's the answer. It's AI, here it says, here's the answer for this step in this patient's care. But then there are five more steps that have to happen. And so um, 
I think AI could be integrated into that process and be very, very effective and can help and help make it more scalable, can help reduce costs, certainly labor costs. Um, but until we have a, a digital way or, or a better way to create process to get you from point A to point B, only then are you going to be able to plug in these sorts of analytics or tech tools like AI, in my opinion. I think it's good. One of the examples I was thinking is medical imaging analytics. There is some really, really cool technology uh, that has been developed around medical imaging analytics, but some of the companies have struggled because they haven't been able to work their way into the workflow, right? And 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 add value in the workflow. So you can't do it with technology alone. Uh, you have to be able to figure out how you can get into the workflow and what, which effectively means, you know, add value to a process. Well, and if I can just jump in real quick here, we we see a lot of a lack of actionable actionables that you're gonna that you're gonna have with that. So it, it, you can identify something, you can build a dashboard, you can you can do anything, but someone is going to have to look at that, think, and make some and and, and even and make some action on, towards that. And that's what uh, what some of our client uh, the clients of our portfolio companies are. Are really saying, you know, you're bringing me uh, uh, something new. I'll have to hire someone, train someone to look at that information and make a decision. I need you to make that decision. So you you kind of have to build everything on top. And in, in my point of view, maybe the, the the real value that we could add in the future is we have we have this we have the processes. We are powered by AI. We build the dashboards, and we can we can indicate you should do that or this patient that has to be treated right now because something is going to happen, please do this or, and make the life of the, of the, of the client easier. Yeah, if you build a dashboard, you're just adding more information on, on top of a lot of more information and you're over, overwhelming them with, a, with something new that they have to either hire someone or train someone to use that. And we go all the, all the way back to ROI and, and to costs again. Well, Gustavo, I think you should talk to Will after the after this um, event because I, I had companies basically that were doing the same thing that were using advanced analytics that basically provide an indication. And now what? And so what we've done is started to um, you know integrate between the two companies where those uh, analytics trigger workflows and it, it tells you what the next step is. And uh, definitely, let's catch up, Will. Well, you I, know, I mean, some I... of the most important some of the most important work in life is the hardest work. And when you're getting a lot of pushback or it's in a year and a half in a sales cycle into a healthcare system, you know, that can be one of two things. Either either what you're doing is not important or pertinent, right? Or not valuable. Or maybe it's you're changing a paradigm. Maybe you're shifting how we think about the provision of healthcare in a way that hasn't been done before. And in terms of a process revolution, that's what I see is the future of healthcare. That's what I want to be a part of. It's so damn hard. It, it's um, because you're changing how people think about it. And um, everybody talks about things and it's all analytics. It's all dashboards. It's all data management. But you, but then you hear the clinicians and other people talking about, well, process. How do you do this? How do you implement it? How do you connect these insights to the point of care? And yet there are very few tools to do that outside of what people are using, which is the EMR, which is if you're counting on your EMR to take you to the next step of innovation in healthcare, you got a real problem because it's not going to do it. And to that point, um, I, I'm just a bit you know, conscious of time and, and, but I just want, I have one more question at the risk of, of running a few minutes over, but that, that's fine. We're having a good time. Um, you know, you know, we, we, we've heard a lot about the kind of difficulties of, of, of not just implementing technology, but just, you know, selling into the healthcare system. Um, so, so to close things out, and, and this is open to, to, to the whole panel, you know, what, what kind of general advice would you give to, you know, startups like, like, like Wills that are, are trying to, to sell into the system and, and get investments as well as, as, as two investors that are trying to find the kind of gems out there, um, that will really make an impact. I, I'll take a shot at this one. So basically what I would say is solve a real problem and then figure out your way into the workflow and show how you can deliver a strong ROI and like we'll call it near-term, short-term ROI in, in, in the healthcare industry. And, um, and then you have a, a real shot at making a difference. But you have to have you know, kind of just the, the, 
the full, like what, what we talked about before, the three areas really, really handled, or you're going to have a very challenging time uh, penetrating into the healthcare market. I would agree 100% with Eric. Everything that he said, and I'll try to add some some things here, but uh, I, I, I we also always tend to have a, a better a better understanding of companies that are trying to solve a specific problem and then moving on. We, we're we not huge fans of trying to solve a, a, a Amazon of healthcare or anything like that. It's an extremely complex ecosystem. It's very hard to navigate. It's very hard to sell. It's very hard to build in healthcare. So if you're looking towards solving one big problem or one specific problem that has opportunities to open up into new clients or, or new uh, solutions that you can build on top of that, that's something that really uh, shines uh, shines with us. So look for a, a challenging and specific problem and build on top of that. That's something that, uh, that I think it's very important. And the other one is understand that this is not a traditional VC market, such as consumer or FinTech or anything like that. It's everything is different in healthcare. The growth is different. The access is different. The way that you sell is different. And entrepreneurs are different. We'll, we'll definitely can, can build on top of that. But it's, an, it's a very specific and different kind of entrepreneur that you see in healthcare. And, 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 and they have to understand how, how the system works in order to navigate that uh, in that ecosystem fast. Yeah. Yeah. If I could also add, um, Fernando, I, I agree with the comments that have been made. Um, and I, I think the, understand that it is a slow sell. It is going to be a slow sell and have that patience to work closely with um, a strategic partner to actually develop that solution, valid, have it validated. And remember, it is a long term, high value opportunity. It may take a long time, but generally healthcare opportunities are high value. And so work closely with a strategic partner who can help you develop the right solution where there is a real unmet clinical need. And I have three comments. One, um, financial short-term, articulate your financial short-term benefit. You have to, or you won't get in the door. I agree with Eric. Um, two, make sure if you're gonna go into this work that you're well-rested when you start because it's exhausting, but it's so meaningful. And so you have to find the right entrepreneur that's passionate about it because they'll burn out and they'll quit. So that's the second thing if I were investing. And then the third thing, um, you know, this is transformational stuff. It, transformation is hard and you've got to have a short-term benefit, but you have to have a long-term vision you can articulate because the return on that, both socially, medically, and also financially is huge. The multiples on, on these sorts of companies, if you pick the right ones and you stick with them and you support them is really, is really huge. And people ask me um, with our, the work in, in global uh, development in healthcare, they say, how do you, how do you decide who to give money to? Why should I give money to you? And why should, and my, my answer is, well, always ask the person, what is your long-term vision, your long-term plan? If they come back with a five or even 10 year long-term plan run, because they don't understand global development and they don't understand healthcare. They need to come back with a 25 year vision and a 25 year plan. That's who you want to stick your money with. And so I think you have to go into it understanding that that paradigm and that reality about about healthcare. And that's how you that's how you pick who you invest in. Well, I think I think that's a great note to, to wrap things up on there. Um, you know, th th thank you all so much for, for joining me today. Will, Eric, uh, Tass and Gustavo, I, I, mean, I had a great time speaking to you all. So, so thanks very much. And then just just by way of let me just share my screen, uh, just by way of closing out the session here, we have a, just a few um, kind of housekeeping items from from our end. Uh, so our, our our next um the next wave um, uh, webinar will be on on the eighth of May, and it'll be dealing with with follow on rounds. You know, CVCs and the art of the follow on. Um, and you know, this is something that all investors kind of uh have to reckon with at some point, unless you're kind of one and done type. But but those are are, are relatively rare. And so definitely make sure to, to, to tune into that one. We've, we've already got some very interesting guests lined up, so you won't want to miss that one. Um, and then just a few on our upcoming events. We've got the GCV Symposium uh, late June between the 24th and 26th in London, the GCV Executive Leadership Forum uh, in, in Menlo Park in late October. 
which is closely followed by the corporate venture in Brazil, the, the annual kind of uh, Brazil slash uh, LATAM event that we have between the 28th and 30th. That one's always a great time. Gustavo can attest to that. Um, always, always very, you know, very good event. Highly recommend if, if, if you are involved or are planning to be involved in any kind of investment activity in Latin America. Um, and if you want to get in touch, uh, there's my email, fmcutterrivera at globalventuring.com. And uh, replays of all the webinars will be on our site, globalventuring.com. So uh, on that note, you know, thanks again to all our panelists and all our, uh, our everyone who kind of tuned in uh, to listen. Uh, and that's it from me. And see you guys on the next one. Take care.